I guess. Okay, so uh, yeah, so hello everyone, and uh, yeah, thanks for attending uh, this talk, uh, where where I'm actually excited to talk about uh, my PhD work, the work that, that I've done at ETH Zurich, uh, where where I was a PhD student until August. Since then, I moved to MIT as a postdoctoral fellow, uh, as Nick was already already said. So this is work done together with my uh, great collaborators, Gary, who's also a PhD at ETH Zurich, Professor Thomas Hoffman, who is our supervisor, and a bunch of students that we supervised for, for master thesis and bachelor thesis during, during the last two years. So I'm gonna talk about non-Euclidean representation learning, and I'm gonna focus mostly on spaces of constant curvature I'm gonna I'm gonna detail uh, later, and um, yeah, so I'm gonna focus on discrete data such as words, entities, and especially hierarchical structures. <coughs> okay, so as you all know, uh, we we want to do machine learning on discrete data. So the way to do it is, for example, knowledge graphs like like the one you see here in the picture, and the typical way to do it is to embed this discrete data. So if we have words, we want to embed each word and then have a compo compositional layer on top, of, on top of this word embeddings in order to embed large pieces of text like sentences or paragraphs. If we have knowledge bases, we want to embed maybe each node or each edge in the, in the knowledge graph or both and maybe again have some compositional layer on top of it that is able to capture interactions. Um, so yeah, so, so that's the general pipeline. And what do we do with these embeddings? So we can use them in downstream tasks. For example, we want to do machine translation, or maybe we want to do sentiment analysis for text. We want to understand if a review for a movie or for a product is positive or negative. Or we just want to do clustering. We want to discover in an unsupervised fashion topics in the data or particularities in, in subgroups of, of our data. Uh, and last no, but not least, maybe we want to we want to do something on graphs, so on more complicated discrete structures, where we want to do classification or even graph generation nowadays for let's say molecular data. Okay, so the typical like workhorse for for embeddings is to use Euclidean geometry. So. The goal here, so in general, we want to embed data in a geometric space, right? And Euclidean space is like the simplest one. And we, we kind of have like three goals in mind when we do that, maybe implicitly or explicitly. So we, what we want to do is we want to capture semantics via distances, via geometric distances, so distances in these spaces. So maybe you want semantic similar entities to be close in this space. For example, new or cities like New York, Beijing, Paris, and maybe semantic dissimilar entity should be far away. So maybe New York and airplane are not so, so close in, this, in, in semantics. So maybe we want them to be far in the space. And last but not least, maybe we want geodesics or like, like what, what we know as being straight lines in Euclidean space. We want them to be semantically meaningful. So one example is, for, uh, is like uh, doing a word analogy, as you all know, like this king, queen, man, woman example that's very popular. Um, so a fundamental question that I'm trying to step to take steps towards uh, in this talk is what is a good embedding geometry to capture the global similarity structure of the data and maybe not also just similarity but more, more complicated structure like hierarchical structure. So what do I mean by good embedding geometry? Well it's it's it has to be a geometry that gives a good inductive bias or a good prior for, for some assumptions about, about the data that we, that we are using. So I'm going to have a few slides now where, where I'm going to have an, over, an overview of challenges and, and contributions that I'm going to cover in this talk. So one, one interesting aspect is how to learn good embeddings such that we capture the underlying hierarchical or entailment structure. Um, okay. um, and I'm, I'm going to focus on, in particular, on the hyperbolic space because that's, that's the focus of my, uh, of, of my PhD and of this talk. So in this example here, uh, if you see this picture, let's say we have the WordNet uh, tree 
And one example is we have the node that represents animal, like the, the generic concept of animal, and then we have subconcepts which are mammal, or maybe some some animal with wing, uh, some some class of animals that have wings, like birds, and then we have a subclass of of all or of these two, which is let's say the bat. So we, we want to be able to embed this type of data in a meaningful way. So what is a hyperbolic space? So hyperbolic space is a non-Euclidean space, which acts as a geometric prior for hierarchical or tree structures, uh, or, or just uh, data that has a heavy tail distribution like scale-free or, or, uh, or, uh, or scale-free networks that fo follow power law distribution. I'm, I'm gonna show uh, more in, in a second. So here on the left side, you can see the hyperbolic space is essentially constrained to be in a ball of a fixed radius. So embeddings are, are, are embedded in such a ball. And these black lines, uh, these black curves that you see here are, are actually straight lines in this space. So they are, they are essentially the curves that connect the two points in the shortest, uh, using the shortest distance. So if you want an analogy, you know that if you travel, let's say from, uh, I don't know, from San Francisco, let's say to, I don't know, Berlin, then you usually don't follow the straight line on a map, but you follow what is the shortest path on the sphere, on the, on the earth sphere. So this is like, this is like a, a good analogy to understand what, what these shortest path are, paths are, these geodesics. Um, okay, so, uh, I'm gonna cover um, a paper that we that we have uh, submitted at ICML and we have that has been published at ICML 2018 uh, regarding regarding this uh, aspect. So it's gonna be one of the today's focus. Um, <clears throat> and the second aspect that I'm gonna talk about is how to simultaneously capture similarity and hierarchy in the embedding space. So for example, how we can do hyperbolic word embeddings. And let's say we don't want just to have word embeddings that are good to capture, or capturing word similarity or word analogy, but maybe you also want word hypernemy. So we want to know if something is a subconcept of something else, just based on looking at, at the embeddings, the corresponding embeddings. And here uh, we have a publication, if you're interested to read all the details, uh, that was that's published at iClear 2019, actually. Sorry, so there is a small mistake here. Um, <clears throat> and the the last thing, the last aspect that I'm going to talk today about is how to use these non-Euclidean embeddings to perform downstream tasks. So how to design and use hyperbolic neural networks that are, or hyperbolic deep learning tools that are able to respect this geometry. And here uh, we have this hyperbolic neural networks paper that was uh, presented at New Rips 2018 and it, it also had a spotlight. Uh, so you can, you can also refer to the, to the paper for the full details. Okay, so now a few, int a few introduction slides about hyperbolic geometry and how, how we can use it in machine learning or how people have started to use this hyperbolic geometry in machine learning. So as you know, almost all machine learning or deep learning pipelines, they assume Euclidean geometry. And why is this? Like the reason is simple. Uh, it's, a simple it's the simplest geometry. It matches very well our 3D intuition. It's well studied. It's a powerful formalism. It has very simple and efficient formulas, let's say inner product, L2 distance, vector addition, scalar multiplication, linear interpolation, and so on. Uh, and they are very, uh, they are very computationally, they are, these are very efficient and they work very well. However, um, there are some constraints of Euclidean geometry that might hurt one depending on what type of data is used. So people typically capture similarity of like discrete objects using dot products. Um, can everybody hear me still or is it? We are still here, we can hear okay, you. Great, great, I'm gonna continue. <laughs> okay. So, uh, so we, we, we typically capture similarities using dot products 
And these dot products are functions that are constrained to be positive semi-definite if we work in the Euclidean space, which means that if we, if we build the so-called gram matrices, which are just uh, matrices where if, if you have n objects, you just build the matrix of pairwise similarities, then these are constrained to be positive semi-definite. And uh, as I'm gonna talk a bit about later, this is, this, this is a constraint. So <clears throat> we cannot embed large classes of graphs um, without no distortion or loss of information. For example, cycles or, or trees. So you see here like very simple graphs which represent um, a cycle on, on the left and on the right, uh, a very simple tree. And using this type of Poincare, this Poincare type inequalities, one can actually prove that um, these graphs cannot be embedded in Euclidean spaces of any dimension with distortion less than square root of two and respectively two over square root of three. So here one, one would be perfect, would be, a, would, be a, uh, would be a perfect distortion, which would mean that, that the graph distances are exactly matched in the embedding space and bigger than one means already we encounter some, some distortion. So we cannot really place, let's say this square, uh, this square on the left, we cannot place it in, in any Euclidean space such that the graph distances are exactly matching the embedding distances. So the Can distortion is, I'm oh, sorry, Nick, go ahead. Yeah, go, go ahead, go ahead, uh, I'll ask this. So the distortion is how much like you have to pretty much distort the distances such as to map it to the Euclidean space? Yes, exactly. So I didn't put the actual formal definition of, of distortion here. It's actually the standard one that's used when, when people talk about graph embedding distortion. But intuitively what it is, is essentially you measure the, uh, the embedding distance between two nodes, between the embedding of the two nodes, and you want that to be as close as possible to the graph distance, which is the length of the shortest path in the graph. So in this, in this case, it's gonna be two, the graph distance is gonna be two for the two opposite nodes in the square. Um, whereas if, like in this picture that's, that's shown here is actually square root of two in the Euclidean space. So in practice, it turns out you cannot, you cannot put this square in any Euclidean space with a distortion less than square root of two. Uh, so it, if you want, it, it's, it's like the ratio of the embedding distance over the graph distance. It's, it's something like that. So it's not exactly that, but it's, it's, like, it's like something like that, like the average ratio. Yeah, it makes sense. The concept makes perfect sense. So, so what you're trying to embed over here is four nodes that they all have a distance of one between them. It's like a, a, a click. And there's- No, not, not no. exactly. The distance between two opposite nodes is, is gonna be two because it's a graph distance. So, oh, so the, graph is just, the graph is just a cycle, a cycle of length four. Okay, so you can match the first one. So the, I see what you're saying. So the distance between neighboring nodes is one, but the yeah. distance between two half has to be two, but here is square two, square root of two, and the same thing with, uh, with a star. I yeah, it's square root of two in this particular embedding, but you could maybe come up with different embeddings uh, you, you can stretch it in different directions, but it's not gonna, it's not gonna get you a better distortion than, than this specific embedding here. I get it. So the graph distances, which is hop distances, cannot be preserved. Yeah. The shortest paths. Yes. One, actually, one very simple way to see that it cannot be preserved is that it's not gonna satisfy triangle inequality in the sense that the distance from the two uh, opposite nodes is actually the sum of the two distances in, in, in the triangle. Uh, I cannot really show here, but anyway, so triangle inequality is not satisfied in any, so in any metric space, you cannot get a perfect distortion. But what it turns out is that you can actually put a, any cycle in a spherical space with arbitrary low distortion. So one plus epsilon for any epsilon that's arbitrary low. And the tree, you can put it in a hyperbolic space with arbitrary, again, arbitrary low distortion. So again, one plus epsilon, where, where one is perfect. Okay, that was, that was clear, thank you. Okay, yeah, feel free to interrupt if you have any, any other questions. Um, okay, so the Euclidean spaces can model perfectly only intrinsically flat manifolds. 
So these are manifolds like surfaces, if you want, that can be they can be stretched uh, without any with, without encountering without, without encountering any distortion, and they can be flattened. So they can be they can be put in like a like a completely flat, let's say, sheet of paper. Um, so just to give you a, a, an, an, another intuition of this is sometimes let's say we have to deal with data that's that's known to not lie in a, in an Euclidean manifold. One example is let's say spherical data. We cannot take a sphere and completely flatten it without large distortion on a on a flat sheet of paper. And uh, the typical example is how to represent uh, how to represent maps of of the of the world uh, on on a flat sheet of paper. And people typically use this, what is called the, the so-called Mercator projection. Th that's a typical representation of maps. But it's kind of misleading if you see here on the left side, like in in this projection. Mexico and Greenland appear to be very, very different, but it turns out they actually have the, 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 a very, very similar surface. So you can actually see where, where, where the distortion happening. And, and on the right side, uh, I'm showing here the United States map. But if you if you just translate uh, United States, like to be close, let's say over Finland, then the representation under this projection is going to show a much larger uh, surface, right? The same for Australia, if you want. So, so there is lots of lots of distortion, and these maps can be a bit misleading, right? So that's amazing. I, I never thought that. I always thought that Greenland was huge, but I never thought it's as small no. as Mexico. No, 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 no. <laughs> yes. Um, Okay, and um, you can, it turns out that this short diagonal inequality that, that I'm showing in this slide is actually very useful to prove all sorts of distortions in the Euclidean space, including the distortions for cycles and trees that I was talking about earlier. Uh, I, I have actually more, of, more details about this in my PhD thesis. I can send it to you if, you are, if any, any of you is interested. Um, so it turns out to have a fundamental limit, so we can only learn what we can represent. So I'm going to motivate a bit more why Euclidean spaces are too narrow for tree-like or hierarchical structures, tree-like graphs or hierarchical structures. So let's say we have a tree and we want to embed it in the Euclidean space. And the idea is that we want to embed it such that nodes that are connected by an edge, they are close in the embedding space. If they are not connected by an edge, then they are far in the embedding space. And ideally, we also want to capture the distance in the tree. So we want to capture the shortest path length between two nodes in the tree, also in this embedding space. So we, if we have a single node that's very simple, we're just going to put it in, in, in anywhere. Now, if we have a tree with two nodes, uh, with two leaves and the, and the root, it's very easy again. But once we start putting more and more nodes, well, so, so far, so good. We have a, a very small tree here. And as I said before, vertices are close in the embedding space, if and only if they are connected by an edge. So let's say the tree grows. Let's say we are dealing with more realistic, like big hierarchical structures. And you can actually see here that the outermost leaves are becoming increasingly close to one another. And even though they are not connected by an edge in the graph, they start to be very, very close. If you look at leaves corresponding to different branches of the, of, of the tree, you will see that they are becoming closer and closer, which is not exactly what we wanted from, from a good embedding space. Uh, so yeah, so things get worse here and we have lost our nice property, which was close in the embedding space if and only if they share an edge. One, of course, you, you can argue here that we can just increase the dimension of the space. This is true, but asymptotically, we still have a problem. I'm, I'm going to discuss about it a bit, a bit later. So yeah, so if, if the trees are getting larger and larger, then we have a problem. Um, so yeah, so what is the problem? The problem is that uh, the Euclidean, uh, the volume of, of an Euclidean ball, it only grows polynomially with a radius. So if we have, if we're in dimension D and we have a radius R, then the volume is proportional to R to the power of D. 
And this is the problem, we, 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 which is why we, we quickly run out of space when we are dealing with structures which have an exponential volume growth, like trees. So in the trees, the number of nodes on each level of the tree grows exponentially with the, tr with the tree level. Uh, however, if we use the so-called hyperbolic space that I'm going to detail uh, now, uh, in this space, the volume of a ball grows exponentially with the radius. So it's, it's, it's the formula shown here. So why is this bad? So if you see here, we have these two nodes that are two leaves. And the Euclidean distance of their embeddings is very, very small, but the tree distance is very, very big. So you have to go to the root and back in order to get the tree distance. So you can see here that the embedding space already lost uh, its nice property uh, of capturing the graph distance. Uh, and here is another like kind of in, maybe in picture to give some intuition. Uh, here on the left side, we have the hyperbolic ball uh, and each bet in this, in this uh, figure has the same hyperbolic area. But of course, if we would view this picture in the Euclidean space, then they would have different areas, right? But in the, in the hyperbolic space, they have exactly the same area. So you can see that the space behaves very similar to Euclidean space if we look, let's say, in the center of the ball. But once we, we, once we go far away from it, uh, the geometry is, is kind of behaving a bit funny. So it's, it's more like, an, it's, it, 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 it kind of has an exponential, um, volume growth, which, which allows exponential space growth. Um, okay, and the first paper that tried to use these hyperbolic spaces in machine learning uh, was published at, at NIPS 2017, NURIPS later. Um, so what they want to do is to measure similarity, not in Euclidean, but in hyperbolic space. Uh, the reason being, like what I already discussed, is a continuous analog of trees. It, it's a good prior for hierarchical structures and scale-free networks. So what are scale-free networks? Um, they are graphs for which the degree distribution follows, is, is basically heavy-tailed. So here I'm showing the log degree distribution um, of, of these graphs. And you can see that the random networks, their network behaves a bit like a, like, like a Gaussian distribution of the degrees where a scale-free network or a hierarchical network, they have like a, like, a, like a more similar degree distribution. So hyperbolic spaces are very good for this type of graphs. Uh, and of course they are very well studied, the spaces are very well studied in mathematics since like a long time ago and uh, in computer networks. Um, so what is a hyperbolic space? Mm, it's a metric space where the distance function is given by, by the formula here in, um, like shown here. And you can actually see, again, I'm showing this picture where all, all edges here, they have exactly the same length under this distance function. Uh, and geodesics or straight lines or shortest paths between two points are shown in this animation here. So you can actually see that we have a, a congestion at the center, a higher congestion at the center than at the border of the ball. And that's because geodesics tend to bend inwards. And th that's maybe why you, you, you can actually see a good inductive bias for this being, being good for embedding scale-free networks. Um, because in scale-free networks, uh, like a few nodes form a core of the graph with high connectivity to the rest of the graph. The same, like, let's say for, for trees. <coughs> so hyperbolic spaces are Riemannian manifolds, and I'm not gonna cover uh, aspects of Riemannian geometry because this is like, like it's gonna be a very long discussion. Um, but I invite, I invite you to read about it, about them if you don't know about these concepts. Um, but what I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say is that uh, this hyperbolic space is a Riemannian manifold with a particularity. It has a constant negative sectional or Gaussian curvature that I'm going to talk a bit about later. Uh, so we, we are interested to work with common concepts from Riemannian geometry, which is the tangent space, geodesics, exponential map, Riemannian metric. So th these are all concepts that, that we need for, for using this uh, in machine learning, this space in machine learning. 
So yeah, so just to give you a, a little bit uh, information about uh, or intuition about uh, about curvature. So we we have we have three notions, three big notions of curvature. One is sectional curvature, the other is Gaussian curvature, and the, the other one, the last one is like Ricci curvature. Um, for hyperbolic spaces, they are all the same, like the spaces are the spaces of constant curvature, negative curvature. So in general, let's say if you have a surface, um, then a sectional curvature is a curvature at a point uh, with respect to a direction. So if you see here, we have this red point and we have the green direction. And then we can measure how curved the surface is if it's, if it's like, if it's like sectioned along along this let's say this curve um, and if 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 this curve is bent let's say inward then we say it has a positive curvature if it's if it's a straight line straight line straight euclidean line then we have we say it ha has zero curvature and if it's bended outwards we say it has a negative curvature so so that's that's a bit of intuition of what, what a sectional curvature is and now a gaussian curvature so if you have a surface, uh, 2D surface in 3D, then in order to compute the Gaussian curvature, you just have to find the two sectional curvatures that are the largest and the lowest. So in, in the case of a cylinder, it's going to be a positive value, which is a green uh, sectional curvature, and the zero value, which is uh, the smallest curvature. And the Gaussian curvature is just a product of these two numbers. And it, it, like a, a bit counterintuitive is that the cylinder is gonna have a zero curvature. But if, if you wanna understand a bit uh, why is this true, then you can actually take the cylinder and you can, you can cut it in, in one, like, like you, you can just do a single section and then it's gonna be completely flattened on, on, uh, on, on a flat sheet of paper. And so you cannot actually question. do this with a sphere, let's say. Um. So the Gaussian curvature on the cylinder is going to be zero, but that's only for the cylinder, correct? Exactly. It's only for this particular okay, yeah, I got you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you. But so let's see, actually I have more examples. So here we can see three examples of, of constant negative uh, Gaussian curvatures. Const, constant means that at every red point is the same value, right? So on the, on the left side, you can see a negative curvature where the surface is, is behaving locally at every red point, at every point, like a saddle, right? So you have, uh, you have two sections, the two opposite extremal directions curve in opposite directions. And then you have the cylinder or a flat sheet of paper where they have zero curvature. And on the right side, you can see the sphere where the curvature is both, both uh, yeah, where the sectional curvature is constant and positive at every point and every section. And um, so we, it's, so the hyperbolic space is, is a space of negative curvature. So it's gonna correspond to the left uh, picture. Um, <clears throat> so triangles, um, they, they behave differently in these spaces. In the Euclidean space or spaces of zero curvature, uh, the angles of the triangle sum up to pi, as you know, if we have a negative curvature less than pi and if it's a positive curvature is more than pi. So here um, I'm showing a picture, a three picture, sorry, of uh, geodesics uh, in, in the three spaces. So K, I'm gonna use K to denote the curvature from now on. So minus one is a hyperbolic space and uh, zero space is Euclidean space. And then on the right side, I'm, I'm showing the stereographic projection of the sphere on a, on a plane. And that's how, how the geodesics on the sphere, they, they look like when projected on this, on this uh, space. So if you want to see more, uh, you can visit our, our blog. Um, <clears throat> here I'm also showing the distance heat map uh, for different types of curvatures. So again, positive curvature is sphere, zero curvature is Euclidean space, and negative curvature is hyperbolic space. So for negative curvature, we have to constrain the space to stay inside the ball of a fixed radius. Okay. I'm gonna um, cover a bit um, the so-called concept of parallel transport. So parallel transport 
means we are, let's say at a point X and we have a blue vector that goes in any direction. And we want to, we want to translate it to a point Y. So th there is an entire uh, mathematical formalism of how you can do that in on a Riemannian manifold. So it's not as trivial as in, in an Euclidean space or not as straightforward. Uh, and here I'm just showing a picture of how it actually looks like. So the two, the, the two blue uh, vectors, they show how the, the, the vector from X is, is parallel transported to, to, the, to, the, to, the, to Y. So this is fascinating. This is, shows how the coordinate system is changing by going from X to Y. So computations that you will do if you were at X, uh, that's why we see all these vectors bending. This is how they look from the X perspective versus Y perspective. Yes. Is that right? Yes, it is. That's, that's right. But within Euclidean, it's really simple. You just change the, the, the origin of the coordinate system and that's it. And yes. uh, some things that, you know, when you're at X are very close. If you go to Y, they can be further away. Very fascinating, good animation. Yeah, we actually so used exactly this oh. concept for uh, word embeddings. When, when you trade word embeddings uh, in this Poincaré glove paper, we actually use this to, to adapt the um, analogy tra uh, translation that's used in more today. I think that's uh, really great when you mentioned that the space is a prior, which means that not every point is equivalent in this. Like in Euclidean space, it doesn't matter where you are, all the points are the same. They don't really have any information. But here, depending on where you are, you know, things change. Would you say that's uh, right? Yes and no. Yes and no. Actually, in these spaces, you also have a concept of so the origin doesn't carry uh, the origin of the of the space doesn't carry any particular meaning. You can still translate the entire coordinate system, but not under the standard translation, but under the so-called zero translation, which is actually related to the spiral transport thing. So it's basically applying the spiral transport you can actually translate a coordinate system. So, so the origin of, of a system doesn't carry any information, which is a bit counterintuitive, but um, yeah, that's it. That's what it is. So I think that's maybe this relevant to what I want to ask. Uh, what X and Y here are fixed in terms of what? Um, I think in terms of um, their distance. In terms of distance, yeah, I would say they're the same distance, but depending on when you are on the sphere, that's why when you are close to the center, they seem to be connected by a straight line. But you, as, as you're moving in the edges, that line bends. So is that right? Yeah. That's what I am. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's the distance, if I recall well, yeah. And that's why it looks like that the, 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 cord, the, um, the axis is also bending more. It's not yeah. behaving very linearly. Yeah. Um, yes. Should we move on? I, I have a lot of slides. I'm not yes, sure. Yes, yes, please move on. I'll Sorry. be able to cover everything, but I'll try to cover as much as we can. Uh, but feel free to send me any also questions afterwards. I'm, I'm really happy to answer. So, um, yeah. So now we have the concept of um, rich curvature, which is the last type of curvature. And intuitively, what it is, so it's measured at a point X and with respect to a vector V in the tangent space of X. So if you want, it's a vector V that, that's, that's origin at X. Um, and it's just, uh, it's just basically measuring the average uh, sectional curvature over all the directions W. And just to give a bit of intuition of what's going on here. So if you look on the left picture, this is taken from, from, from this paper. Um, <coughs> sorry. So we, we have a vector WX. And the end point of this vector is corresponding to a point X prime on the manifold. So if we just do a parallel transportation, so we move WX, we, we translate it as I showed you in the previous animation to Y, then X prime is gonna be translated to Y prime, okay? So now we, we just have to measure the, how is the distance from the distance from X to Y compared to the distance from X prime to Y prime in this manifold. So if we are in the Euclidean space, it's gonna be exactly the same. So X, Y is equal to X prime, Y prime. But if we are in uh, the spherical space, X prime, Y prime is gonna be smaller than X, Y. If we are in a um, space of negative curvature like hyperbolic space, 
is going to be larger. And this gives, this gives uh, another intuition of, on, on, the, on this concept of curvature. Uh, people have taken this rich curvature concept to also to discrete structures like graphs and um, for graphs you can actually do it for every node and instead of a vector v you just take adjacent edges uh, v and they have used this to measure let's say the curvature of edges in in the internet graph internet topology and you can actually see here on the right side uh, on the left side, sorry, <clears throat> uh, rich curvature of every edge um, on this graph. So green means Euclidean and then blue is more like spherical spaces and red is uh, hyperbolic or negative spaces. So you can see that the, the, the core backbone edges or links in this internet topology graph, they, are, they, are, uh, um, they correspond to negative rich curvature, which is again a motivation of why using hyperbolic spaces might be, might be a good idea under, for, for some types of data. I have to say that this internet topology graph is, is uh, like a type of scale-free network that I was talking about before. So a few nodes are kind of central and they, they, they carry central uh, information and many, many nodes are just, just let's say, leaf nodes. Okay, and um, here is just a summary of curvature and uh, how triangles look like, some of triangles, and maybe interesting is like uh, how, the, let's say, circle length and disk area behave. So, yeah, you can see that for hyperbolic spaces, we have the sin h of, um, of curvature, of square root of curvature times radius, which is like an exponential growth in the radius. Okay, so if we want to use hyperbolic spaces in uh, machine learning, then we have to use uh, Riemannian optimization. And what is Riemannian optimization? Is It's essentially a generalization of, of uh, Euclidean tools. Let's say a generalization of stochastic gradient descent, which is called the Riemannian stochastic gradient descent, RSGD. Um, so in SGD, you know, we update a point U by saying it's the new, the new update is U minus learning rate times the gradient. Okay, in Riemannian manifolds, we don't have a, a concept of adding to vectors, but we do have a concept of a similar concept, which is called the exponential map. So what, what people do is that they, they, they just take the exponential map at the, at, at the current iterate u, and then they, they apply minus the learning rate and times what is the so-called Riemannian gradient, which for spaces of constant curvature is just a rescaled Euclidean gradient. So it, it behaves very well and it's computationally very efficient. So you can actually see here on the right side how the Riemannian gradient is computed uh, com uh, from a Euclidean gradient of a point U and R here is just the norm of the vector U. So it, it, it's just a simple rescaling using the norm of U. Uh, can I ask something? Could you just absorb this uh, correction to the learning rate? Would it make any difference, especially if you're doing adaptive learning rate? Would well, that... not really, because this depends on on the point u. So for different different uh, for different values of of your embedding u, it's going to be different. Oh, we... I see. So if you were using a constant learning rate, it wouldn't adjust from point yeah. to point. It right. doesn't depend on the gradient, so it's not like in Adam where you absorb the history of the gradient in the learning rate. Here it depends on the current iterate, the current point U. So I'm not really sure you can do that. No, you are absolutely right. You know, because you... Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm not, yeah. I'm not sure you can do it, but I'm also not 100% sure it's impossible. But anyway, you also have this exponential map on top of it. So it, it gets a bit complicated. Um, anyway, so this provides a fundamental motivation for why we cannot just plug and play the hyperbolic distance into standard machine learning pipelines. We also have to use remaining optimization, which is giving a, yeah, a fundamental difference. <coughs> okay, so I was mentioning this hyperbolic uh, and Poincare embeddings paper. Uh, before, which is the first one that, that has tried to do hyperbolic um, embeddings. So what they want to do is to measure similarity in uh, hyperbolic space. 
So they take the word net hierarchical structure, uh, let's say here, just the memory subtree, uh, and they embed it in, in the space such that the distance, the hyperbolic distance between two concepts U and V is small if they are connected in the transitive closure of this graph, of this tree, and it's far if they are not, right? So this log likelihood uh, loss function is capturing exactly that. And it turns out that, that they obtain amazing results, like with only, only five dimensions, uh, they, can, they can beat by far Euclidean or translational models for like, let's say 200 dimensions. And a question is what is going on? And here is like a, a 2D visualization. So I basically trained here their model in 2D and you can see how it, it evolves during, uh, so here the, the black lines are the edges of the tree. And you have Euclidean on the left side, hyperbolic on the right side. And you can actually see that the, that the Euclidean embeddings, they are a bit chaotically organized in the space in the sense that, that, um, that the embeddings of, leaf no of some of the leaf nodes are close or close to the root or close to the other branches of the tree. So they really don't reflect so well what we were hoping to reflect, like close if they are close in the tree in, in the tree graph or far if they are farther. But in the hyperbolic space on the other side, it looks, it looks much better. So they seem to be organized and disentangled. The branches of the tree seem to be well disentangled. Of course, it's not perfect, but again, this is just, uh, if you increase dimension, to, if you set it to five instead of two, then you actually get almost perfect disentanglement. So maybe this gives an intuition of why these spaces are, are, are nice. Okay, so what we did um, on top of this paper in our ICML paper was to generalize their concept of, so in, in, in their paper, they just, they just use a symmetric distance uh, between two nodes and we, we want to capture hierarchical uh, structure in the sense that we also want to capture directionality in the graph in the, in the edge. So we want to capture the entailment concepts so V, the subconcept sub of U, which, which corresponds to direct edges in a directed acyclic graph. So we don't want to embed a just undirected graph, but a directed acyclic graph. And of course, use hyperbolic geometry. So um, the previous paper, they, they, they had an experiment where they did something like that for, for uh, WordNet, but they use a heuristical uh, approach, which was not trained, was just use the test time. I, I'm not, I'm not going to cover about that, uh, that because we don't have enough time. Um, the results from another baseline, which is called order embeddings, um, where their goal is to, <coughs> is, is to just put hierarchical structures <coughs> in, in, um, in the Euclidean space in the so-called so, so concept of entailment cones. So let's say you have, we have the, the entity person. So we, we want that the entire quadrant, the green quadrant, if you look on the right side of person, corresponds to embeddings that are subconcepts of person. So let's say woman is a subconcept of person. So we want it to be in the quadrant in, in, in this uh, right, uh, up, up right, upper right quadrant of person. On the other side, skis, let's say, is not a subconcept of person, so we don't want it, we don't want skis to be embedded in this quadrant of person. So, so that's their intuition, and if, if we embed, let's say, a tree, um, like we did here for, for a butterfly data set, so here is, here, here is a data set showed, showed as, as a, basically a set of trees, and here is how it looks like in the embedding space, or using uh, order embeddings. So what we did in our paper was to generalize this, this concept of entailment cones to convex entailment cones, and we did it for any Riemannian manifold. And these cones they induce a partial order in the embedding space. The order being that if U is a subconcept of V, then U, then the embedding of U should be placed inside the entailment cone of V, uh, entailment cone of V. So it's exactly like woman is a subconcept of man, then woman has to be in the cone of man, of, uh, sorry, um, person. Um, so woman is a, is a subconcept of person, then it has to be embedded in, this, in the entailment cone of person. 
Um, <clears throat> so in order to generalize Riemannian convex cones, we just use the concept of tangent space and exponential map. So we know how to do entailment cone, uh, uh, convex cones in Euclidean space. So you know, we had a simple idea of doing it in the tangent space of a point X. And then we just project the entire cone on the manifold using the exponential map and that defines uh, what is a called Riemannian convex cone. So we require like four properties um, that are that are needed, um, and then I'm, I'm not going to cover. It's basically it's, ba it's basically some some uh, simple properties. Um, maybe just the last one that's that's needed for for this being um, defining a partial order in the embedding space, which is called transitivity. So what we want essentially is if X prime is a subconcept of X, then we want that every subconcept of X prime is still a subconcept of X. So just to give you an example, let's say dog is a subconcept of animal. Then we want, let's say, uh, Dalmatian, which is a subtype of dog, to also be a subconcept of animal course. So in the embedding space, this translates into the fact that if X prime is in the convex cone, entailment convex cone of X, then the entire convex cone of X prime should be fully included in the entire convex, in the convex cone of X. So in the picture here, X, let's say, is one of the, one of the uh, small triangles that have a light green cone attached to it. And then X prime is, is one of, is, is let's say a subconcept, which is a small triangle that has a, a, bl a dark blue cone attached to it. So you can see that the entire dark blue cone is completely included in, 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 the, in the light green cone of X. So, so we, we desired this to happen because otherwise uh, the embedding space is not gonna define a partial order relation which is needed for capturing this hypernimia or entailment concepts. So in our paper, we, um, we actually proved that having these four properties defines, is, is enough to define a closed form expression of, of the cone of, at every point X. And the expression is given by this uh, formula here. It, it's, actually, it's actually this formula. Uh, it looks a bit ugly, but uh, computationally is very efficient to implement, and yeah, it, it, the gradients are flowing properly, so everything is behaving very well. So again, I'm not gonna because of time limits. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not gonna get into details of this, but you can read the paper, um, and there are some some proofs there uh, uh, that shows how we got to these closed form expressions. The good part is about it, about it is that now we can actually put all of this into into a loss function. And um, yeah, so I'm, I'm gonna cover it in a, in a second. So these four properties, as I said, they induce closed form expressions of, of entailment cones for different points. And here you can see for different, uh, for different triangles, so different points, which correspond to the green triangles in the hyperbolic space in the Poincare ball, we show the, entailment, the corresponding entailment cones. And a similar derivation was done also for Euclidean. So you, 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 can, you can do a very similar approach for Euclidean angular cones. Uh, so the advantage here of our order embeddings is that the cones, they now extend in all the directions of the space and not just in a single direction. So as you remember, I was showing that these quadrants in order embeddings, they are always expanding in the upper right direction, right? Uh, but in this case, the cone is expanding in all the directions. So this actually shows why, why um, this exploits the space uh, in in a better manner. Yeah. So you make better use of the space. That's amazing. Yes, While because, you know with you. Yes. So that was my question. The whole concept of the cones is to better capture the hierarchy, right? Inherent in the data. Not only the hierarchy, but also the distance. I guess. Yeah, I mean, in this paper, you only looked at high, uh, capturing the hierarchical structure. Uh, and in the paper of uh, wh where we used, uh, where we trained word embeddings, which is a different paper, the one that I mentioned before, then there we also try to capture similarity and word analogy. But here we just focus on, on the same setting as order embeddings, 
which is like capturing just the hierarchical structure when when the hierarchical structure is known. Yeah, so we just use a similar max margin loss function like order embeddings did, except we, we used our formula for interment counts and we had to use remaining optimization. But everything else is, stays the same like in order embeddings in terms of like, like the loss function is very similar. Um, <clears throat> so we also did some qualitative experiments. Oh, I'm really sorry. Um, also did some qualitative experiments and um, I'm showing here uh, like the WordNet MAMAR subtree, MAMAR subtree um, on, on, the, um, on the right side. And on the left side, we have a uniform tree of def seven and branching factor three. And this is how the embeddings look like uh, when we compare Poincare embeddings and which is on the left side and the, on the right side is, is uh, our hyperbolic cones. So you can see that the Poincare embeddings are somewhat collapsed. Um, whereas our uh, hyperbolic cones, they, they are at least visually nicer or somewhat nicer. Uh, we also went and embedding, uh, so here I actually, actually compare order embeddings of, of again, like um, uh, synthetic trees of a fixed branching factor and fixed number of layer of, uh, of levels in the tree. And this is order embeddings. And here is using our version of the Euclidean cones. So you can see that now they expand in all the directions of the space, which is kind of nice. Uh, and then we also did quant quantitative experiments, link prediction in the WordNet. Here we followed previous work and we obtained some nice improvements over, over the baselines that we considered. And we, I have to say that we, uh, training uh, is, a bit, is a bit tricky. So we find out that it's very important to initialize with pre-trained Poincaré embeddings which don't take the direction of the edges in, into consideration, but they, are still, they, they still provide a very good in, initialization. Uh, if we don't do that, then our model is, has very hard times escaping like bad local minima. And we have code that you can check out. Uh, oh, I, and uh, yeah, so here I'm also showing again, uh, Euclidean cones for the data set that I've mentioned before, which is a butterfly species data set. And uh, some performance here that I'm I'm gonna skip now and yeah a few more results so you you can check the slides uh, if you're interested in, in details okay so last thing that I want to cover in the few minutes that I I have left uh, is the paper at uh, the spotlight paper at New York 2018 which is how which is talking about how we can use these hyperbolic embeddings in neural networks okay, or deep learning. Or which with the goal of, of, of having this used in downstream tasks. Does it make sense to just feed these embeddings as inputs, traditional neural networks or deep learning architectures like ResNet, let's say. Yeah, practically we can do this and there are people who attempted to do this, uh, but without, without getting uh, very good results. And in, in theory, at least, uh, hyperbolic geometry is gonna be ignored if, I, if, if we don't, if we don't use operations that make sense, for example, it doesn't make sense to add two vectors in the hyperbolic space, because let's say simply the addition, it makes no sense. And the addition of two vectors might even get out of the, of the domain definition of the hyperbolic space, which one, uh, the, the model that I explained before was a Poincaré ball, so ball of fixed radius. Um, but it doesn't follow the geodesic. Yes, and- um, so Just to understand what you're doing here is, can I ask a question? You're just taking a fully connected, you know, neural networks with traditional ReLUs, and uh, you know, in the objective, you're saying that the distances have to be hyperbolic. Or wh what did you mean by feeding into ignoring the? So already, what exactly already are you trying to? So already setting a, a linear layer on top of a hyperbolic embedding makes no sense, because a linear layer is just a matrix vector multiplication, right? And that operation is not defined in the hyperbolic space. In fact, if the matrix is a vector, then it corresponds to a dot product, right? So that also doesn't make sense. And if so you I see what you're saying. Matrix, you're saying. So basically, you're saying take the hyperbolic embeddings and feed them into a, a you know, as extra, you know, to traditional neural networks. 
yes, I'm saying that this doesn't make sense in theory and it's just ignoring the hyperbolic geometry. It's just acting like uh, the hyperbolic embedding would be an Euclidean embedding with the Euclidean geometry, which is not true. So I'm, I'm, I'm gonna cover it in the next slides and if it's still unclear, we can, we can talk after I show these slides maybe. Uh, okay. Can yeah, it makes perfect. Okay, uh, so as I said, um, we, we have to use Riemannian optimization and we have to enforce hyperbolicity of, let's say, hidden states if we, if we deal with like feed forward networks or recurrent neural networks. So standard operations like vector addition, matrix vector multipli multiplication have no meaning in the hyperbolic space. Vector addition should follow hyperbolic geodesics or straight lines, like I'm gonna discuss immediately. So our idea is to use a generalization of vector spaces, which is called zero vector spaces. So this is a framework that generalizes, uh, th that is gonna be used to generalize neural networks to hyperbolic spaces. So that's the main contribution of this work. So these, these zero vector spaces, they are used in relativity theory because particle speeds are also hyperbolic vectors. Uh, and why is this? If, if you add, so if, if you add two, two speeds, then they should not, they should never exceed the speed of light. So the speed of light, if you want, is like the, is like the radius of, the, of, the, of this Poincare ball. So all the speeds, they have to lie inside, inside the hyperbolic space of this specific radius. And the zero vector spaces, they provide an analog for Euclidean vector spaces. So let's briefly talk about them. So how do, they ch how do the standard operations change? The vector addition is now looking differently. So here the vector addition depends on C. So C is the curvature of the space. So if you put C equals zero, you can actually, which corresponds to Euclidean space, you can actually see that you recover the true X plus Y that you knew for Euclidean geometry. If you put C negative, then you get what is the vector addition in the hyperbolic space. If you put C positive, uh, you get a uh, vector addition on the spherical space. Um, <clears throat> we also have the concept of scalar vector multiplication, which is again shown here. So the formula is a bit more complicated, but it's still like before, if C goes to zero, so if, 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 if we kind of converge to the Euclidean space, then this is gonna become exactly in the, under the limit, it's gonna become R times X as you know it, the standard scalar vector multiplication in Euclidean space. Um, so these operations, they satisfy a few interesting properties, like properties that, that you would hope for. Let's say uh, associativity, scalar distributivity. Commutativity is not satisfied, but it's, it's interesting that is something that is called zero commutativity, which has some, some funny properties. Um, and left cancellation law and, and others. <clears throat> Okay, so we use these two concepts and on top of them we built, oh, so sorry. So I, I also have to say that um, we have a closed form expression of the distance, let's say in a hyperbolic space. Uh, so the distance that, that I showed you before was having some R cos H uh, and, and some, some, some more complicated formula, but it's, it's actually the same as the formula that's shown here. And here you can actually see that it looks a bit like the Euclidean distance as you know it, in the sense that you have now, you don't have the norm of minus X plus Y, but you have the norm of minus X O plus Y. So O plus is like zero addition. So, and on top of it, you have to put some tiny H minus one. So again, if C goes to zero, so the space deforms to Euclidean space and you fully recover the Euclidean distance. And geodesics, they look actually very, very similar to the Euclidean geodesics, except, um, except that we use this plus and this times instead of the standard plus and times. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so again, as I said, all formulas recover the Euclidean variance when the curvature, which is minus C, goes to zero. So what we did in this work is that we derived closed form expressions for parallel transport and for exponential and logarithm maps, which are needed for, let's say, Riemannian optimization. 
So exponential map now looks in closed form like, like, like it's shown here. And then we, we, we went uh, over and um, we designed hyperbolic uh, feed forward neural networks. And our idea is to adapt nonlinearities by just using the so-called concept of uh, logarithm and exponential map at a point zero or the origin. So what we did was to take a point X, which is in the hyperbolic space, we lift it up in the tangent space of, of at zero. Here, the tangent space at zero is the Euclidean space. We apply the nonlinearity, and then we put it back on the manifold using the expo exponential map. And we did, we did the same for matrix vector multiplication. So why we decided to do it like that? It's because the scalar vector multiplication that I showed you before, it's doing exactly the same trick of going in the tangent space of zero, applying the scalar multiplication there, and then going back. Um, so yeah, so the matrix vector multiplication, multiplication satisfies these desirable properties that I'm, I'm not gonna cover. No. Uh, and then we also have to generalize bias translation. And here we use the O plus operation that I showed you before. And it turns out that you can actually write it in a different way, which is you, you, you lift up the point B in the tangent space at zero. Here you, you do a parallel transport from zero to X. And then from X, you put it back on the manifold using the exponential map. So all of these operations now are enough to define fit for or neural networks. Uh, and of course we can do also vector concatenation. It's just a simple generalization. Again, all models recover their Euclidean uh, neural networks as you know them when the curvature goes to zero. So when the space is deformed to Euclidean space. What we have to do next is to, de is to generalize softmax layer or or what is so-called multi-class logistic regression. And here we, we followed previous work and we, 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 have, we, we took a different view on the softmax layer, which is, let's say we have, um, we, we have data X and it can have one of the K classes. So in the softmax layer, what we do is that we learn a vector. So in the soft, soft, softmax layer, we, we apply a linear layer and then we apply the standard softmax function. This is actually equivalent to learning an AK vector for each of the K classes. Taking a dot product with X, this gives us a real value, adding a bias, BK, and then this is like the final value of the logit for this specific class. And by gathering all the K logits, we just apply a softmax function on top of it. So this is actually equivalent, as I said, to the standard softmax layer as you know it. <clears throat> so you can actually reformulate this as a signed distance to a hyperplane in the Euclidean space. So hyperplane is defined at a point P and an orthogonal direction A. So it has this equation here, like, the dot product between X minus P and the orthogonal direction A has to be zero. Um, and if you, if, if you just rewrite the first equation on this slide, you'll, you'll, get a, you, you'll get a different formulation, which is essentially saying that uh, the softmax probability is just a sign of value, which tells us on which side of the hyperplane the point X is. So it's plus or minus one. And then we have the norm of the orthogonal direction or of the normal direction to the hyperplane, which you can set it to one. And then you have the, this interesting quantity, which is the distance from the X to the hyperplane. So what this is saying is that if, if we are far away from, if X is far away from the hyperplane, that we are more sure about the class of X. But if X is very close to the hyperplane, to the margin, let's say the margin of, of, of our classification procedure, of our, our, our classification model, then we tend to have a smaller logit value. So we are not so sure about the class of this point X. So that's exactly uh, what the softmax layer is saying. And now using this last equation, we actually needed this in order to generalize it to the hyperbolic space or to a non-Euclidean space. And the first challenge was to define what is a hyperbolic hyperplane. 
And we did it in a very analog manner to the Euclidean space, except we now use um, the, the new plus, the new zero addition. You can actually read the details in our paper of why this makes sense and why, why this is a, a good generalization. And we also obtained a closed form expression of the distance, but now is like the hyperbolic distance from X to the hyperplane. So this is like the, the short, the, the smallest distance from X to any point lying on the hyperplane. Uh, and that's the final formula for our hyperbolic softmax. So it, it looks a bit like, like the one before, except we have a few more concepts like, like uh, inverse of CNH and, um, and a, de a denominator. But what's very nice about it is that uh, actually when, when the curvature goes to zero, then again, we recover the standard uh, softmax layer. And here I'm showing an animation of a 3D animation of how a hyperplane is looking like in, in the case of 3D hyperbolic space. So the green, uh, the green uh, plate, if you want, soup plate, is like the um, vi visualization of the hyperplane. And uh, the red point is the point P where, where the hyperplane is, let's say, defined it. And, and the, um, the line is just the orthogonal, uh, the normal uh, direction to the hyperplane. So as I said, uh, we recover the Euclidean variance when the curvature goes to zero. And here I'm showing an animation of how the distance to the hyperplane looks like. So it's basically a heat map of the square root distance to the hyperplane. And what I was showing before was only for hyperbolic spaces, but here we, we also have it for uh, spherical spaces. So yeah, so when K is positive, then we have a spherical space. So here's the stereographic projection of the sphere. When k is zero, we have the Euclidean space. And when k is negative, we have what I showed you before, the hyperbolic space. So we have more uh, cool animations in, on our blog. Uh, so Andreas, a, a former student of mine, has, has made these nice, uh, nice plots. So you can, you can feel free to check them. Yes, okay. So the last contribution of this uh, paper was to, was to design hyperbolic recurrent neural networks. And we focused on RNNs and uh, gated recurrent units. And since I'm running a bit out of time, I'm not gonna discuss too much, but it's essentially, um, we, we just use these new operations uh, instead of the Euclidean operations. And we showed why, why this makes sense. And um, we also recovered the Euclidean RNN and GRU when, when the curvature goes to zero. So we did some experiments. Uh, one is to, to, to do classification. If we are looking at, at let's say, subtrees of the Warner tree, we embed them with Poincare embeddings, like the paper that I talked about before. And then we want to use, let's say, the softmax layer that we designed, the hyperbolic softmax layer, to classify them as being part of the subtree or not. So here we have different dimensions, two, three, five, ten. And then we have the hyperbolic softmax layer, we have the Euclidean softmax layer, and we have log zero. So log zero is essentially um, a baseline where we take the embeddings in the hyperbolic space, we lift them up with a logarithmic uh, map to the tangent space of zero, which is Euclidean space. And we just do a, a standard classification like softmax uh, in that space. So you can see that uh, our model is most of the time uh, beating the, these two baselines. Yeah, very, very impressive differences. Although I see in the first, as you increase the dimension on the second, they, they all tend to come close, but uh, in the last two, you know, the differences are pretty significant. Yeah, yeah. I, I have to say uh, that um, this hyperbolic embedding so far, most of the people have seen impressive results in low dimensions, but not so much in high dimensions, with the exception of the table that I showed you in the beginning from, for WordNet. Um, and I mean, this is still part of ongoing research, like how to, how to make these models also work very well in high dimensions. It might be also, I mean, we, we have also seen, uh, many people have seen that optimization is actually very difficult in these spaces. It's much more difficult than, in the, in, than compared to Euclidean spaces. 
Um, so here you can actually see a bit of intuition of why, why you got these nice results. Uh, so here the, in 2D, the green hyperplane, we, we have the two green hyperplanes. Left uh, side is hyperbolic, right side is Euclidean softmax, so Euclidean hyperplane, so with a straight line. And you can actually see that uh, since, yeah, the, 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 since, uh, let's say, the hyperbolic uh, hyperplane is bended, uh, then it's able to, to, to leave out most of the most of the yellow points, which are just uh, just uh, false negatives. Sorry, false positives. <laughs> um, yeah. So we also did uh, in, uh, experiments on textual entailment, like uh, SNLI and um, uh, SNLI data set and some synthetic data set. Uh, so I'm not sure I have enough time to talk about them. But yeah, you, you, can, you can read them in, in our paper. Uh, so I just want to conclude uh, that, um, yeah, I, I, I hope you enjoyed this talk. And of course, we, we looked at spaces of constant curvature. There are still many challenges, like how to do optimization, and then how to adapt uh, hyperbolic, uh, how, how to adapt deep, deep learning tools and how to make them be state of the art in different tasks. Like let's say for images, there is no, no paper that really obtains uh, state of the art results on images so far. So that's, that's very interesting. We, we, are also, we, we are also interested to look into other tractable types of geometry. So the good part about spaces of constant curvature is that you have all these quantities like distance, exponential map, geodesics, they're all in closed form. So you can actually put them in a, in a machine learning model and you don't suffer in terms of like computational inefficiency. So they're actually very nice and, and it's very important to have them in closed form also because of back propagation. So you want gradients to flow properly. So yeah, so that's very nice. So we started looking also at matrix manifolds and we, we're gonna have a submission at ICML this year. Um, and how to combine spaces of different constant curvatures. There is a paper uh, product of spaces that I have on the next slide. And also how to do generative models. So yeah, that would be cool to see some uh, guns on that. <laughs> yes. anybody try that? Not yet. Um, not that I'm really aware of. Yeah. Is there a difference when you use convolutional networks or it should be the same? Or are there, you know, you presented a fully connected layer, but CNN should be similar yeah. since they are yeah, equivalent. Yeah. I, I, I know people have tried that for images, but it's, it's a bit unclear in, image, in images like how you would embed any, every pixel as a different point in the hyperbolic space, or, I mean, it's, 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 it's a bit unclear how to do it. Uh, people have, yeah, I, I know at least one paper that has tried to, to generalize convolutions. And, but they, they couldn't be state of the art. Um, so yeah, that, that's what I know. Um, so yeah, so feel free to check our blog posts um, that are listed here. And yeah, we, we hope in this blog post to provide a more, more introduction and more easy to read resources for people that don't have time to read the papers into details or other references. But I also put here a bunch of references that you might find interesting. Of course, they are not, they're far from being complete. So, yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Octavian. It was, uh, it was really uh, amazing. I mean, I'm a big fan of, the, of this work and I wanted to share that with my colleagues. Um, I don't think we have time for, I don't know if anybody has questions. I probably uh, have to drop because I'm already late for other meetings. Uh, I will uh, uh, definitely download and share with you. The, we'll also upload it on, on YouTube uh, so you can share it with, uh, uh, with other people as well.